Take a moment and think of the worst day you had at work or at school. Why was it so stressful? What else was going on in your life at that time? How long did it take you to recover from all those stresses? Because if we have one stressful day, we can take time afterwards to recover and relax. We bounce back. But if it's been a tough few weeks, it's been one thing after another, it's going to take longer and longer for us to bounce back. Too much stress can actually result in a tipping point. This tipping point, you could snap at your boss, you could shout at your family, you could even totally burn out. And there's no quick recovery from a burnout. <laughs> Or yelling at your boss, you can't just take a Netflix and chill and hope that your boss has a bad memory. It's not going to work out well for you. <laughs> Burnouts, therapists recommend many months of recovery. It's not like you can just get back to work the next day. And too much stress for too long can actually change the physiology of your body. It can reduce your life expectancy. Now, in nature, accumulating these stresses that make it longer to bounce back is called critical slowing. And just like an unsustainable workload, nature around the planet is suffering from burnout and unsustainable stress. These stresses are getting so bad that they can actually shift from one state to another for good. They may never completely recover on any human timescales. A good example of this is the Amazon rainforest. It's so large that it creates its own weather system. It drives the rain it needs to stay healthy. But as you probably know, in recent years, we've been seeing deforestation, wildfires, and climate impacts. And it's getting smaller and smaller. It could reach a point at which it can no longer drive the rain to stay healthy and then it could continue to die back in a further self-reinforcing cycle called a feedback. Now, I'm not saying that this could happen tomorrow or that the Amazon is going to instantly collapse. But in a few decades, if we continue to warm the planet, the Amazon would be beyond a point of no return. It would shift from a verdant rainforest to a scorched grassland. And it's worth remembering that about 80% of this deforestation is driven by growing crops that are fed to animals, which then we eat on our plates as beef or steak all the way around the world. And spoiler alert, there's some hope coming later related to that. While scientists have done a fantastic job of estimating increasing temperatures for the emissions into the atmosphere, as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, shows, there's actually been an underestimation of the severity of some of the impacts of climate change and how fast some of these transitions could take place. You might think this is kind of hard to believe that the speed of these transitions could be underestimated. You might think, well, scientists are on it, right? Like, surely we understand these things. But actually, it's pretty complicated. If you take the boreal forest, for example, there are now higher temperatures further north. And so the pests in these boreal forests are able to move further north, and they're eating through the trees, and they're leaving husks in their wake. This is extra fuel for wildfires. And at the same time, lightning is actually moving further north as well, due to the climatic changes. So the ignition spark of these fires are also moving further north. The result is that all these stresses together can make it very difficult for these forests to recover. And we're seeing this not just in the Canadian boreal forest, but also in Siberia and other areas. These compounding effects make it super difficult to understand how these tipping elements might unfold. It's biology, meteorology, climatology, sometimes even chemistry. There's now a small to, impo well, small to uh, impossible to ignore chance of cascading tipping elements. This is where we could see the natural systems of the planet tip one after another like dominoes. Now, it would have to get warmer to do that, but if the temperature rises too high, this risk really goes up. These are the tipping elements already threatened at one to three degrees. Now, we're at 1.2 degrees now in 2022, and we're probably going to push beyond 1.5. The ice melt in the North and South Poles are already tracking the worst case scenarios. And some of these elements are interconnected. As ice is lost in the Arctic Sea, the area warms up and we see more melt from Greenland and we see more sea level rise from it. At three to five degrees, more tipping elements kick in and they're also interconnected. We are currently on track for somewhere between two and 3.2 degrees, depending on how much action we take and how much we actually see this as an actual emergency right now. 
It's important to realize, though, that these aren't the overnight tipping points of a riot, or yelling at the boss, or riots, or, or, or memes. These tipping points take decades, centuries, millennia to even unfold. So right now, scientists think that the Greenland ice sheet is actually beyond the point of no return. But it's going to take hundreds, if not a thousand years, for that to fully unfold. So we've got time to cope with some of these changes. The IPCC reports have also shown underestimations in the impacts on societies of climate change. We're actually more vulnerable and fragile than we previously thought. One research group went around the world and looked at all the different ways climate change can impact us. They found over 140 different threats to the benefit, the benefit of societies. This is actually intentionally a little bit overwhelming, so let's zoom in on three examples here. One is water scarcity impacts, which can affect the availability of food, which can affect malnutrition, which can cause disease, and result in migration and conflict. Each of these threats interact with one another, so that the whole is greater than any one of these alone. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, there's more bad news coming. We have got a nice of it coming <laughs> later on. So, we're actually seeing this already in food system impacts around the world. So we're seeing uh, floods in the US, we're seeing droughts in the Punjab region. And the chance of multi breadbasket failures, where multiple extreme events hit major food producing regions at once, goes up the warmer we get. One study found that corn, which is the most sensitive crop, would see multi breadbasket failures increase from once every 16 years historically to once every three years at 1.5 degrees and once every two years at two degrees. In fact, through the 2000s, although we've seen quite large reductions in food insecurity, this has leveled off. This is starting to increase again, especially in low and middle income nations that are stressed by conflict, COVID, and climate change. It is a stressor that makes everything else worse. And high-income nations aren't going unaffected either. Just look at the wildfires in the US, the, in Australia, the flooding in Germany and Belgium. These are well-resourced nations that are struggling to keep their communities safe from climate change. It's here and now, and it is an emergency. And it's very hard to see, actually, how civilization could continue in its current form in an organized way if we get too warm, if we get towards some of these higher temperatures. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but this makes me really despondent. And I don't know any environmental scientists who haven't gone through at least a short phase of being scared out of their minds. It's a little secret. We do feel that way. But I think it's important to talk about how this makes us feel, because I think it's important to be honest about the situation that we're in. Not so that it's just some nebulous doom and gloom that switches us off, but that we know what's coming that we know what the risks are that we're taking, and that we know the different things that we need to do to act can make the world a much better place. We really need to commit to acting like this is an emergency. We also need to be honest about hope. We need to specify this hope, where it comes from, because there is hope, it might be hard to believe. And we need to work towards it like we've worked towards nothing ever before. And yeah, you might find this difficult to uh, believe, but I actually have a lot of hope for the future as well not only for avoiding the worst outcomes, but for actually doing the things that we know would make for a much better world, even if we didn't hear the climate clock clicking, ticking in our ears. And, you know, we've been talking about the natural tipping points, but there are many, many social tipping points that can really help us out and move much faster to avoid some of these catastrophic outcomes. I'll give you some examples now. It's really hard to believe, but actually, the transition to renewable energy and cleaner transport is totally unstoppable. We can already produce 80% of our energy by electrifying it and then making that electricity with renewables. And in fact, it's become so cheap that we've seen a tipping point in renewables. Look at the cost of solar and wind in recent years, undercutting gas and coal. In fact, it's cheaper to build new wind and solar in many areas of the world but to continue to put coal in a coal power station that's already been paid for. I mean, this is revolutionary in terms of a tipping point that we can harness. And not only that, but we would save millions each year from pollution, from power stations, from cars, from our urban environments. We had thought, you might think, well, what about that 20% you know, that we had left? We had thought that that would be going to be really difficult. But actually, that, even that's looking easier the more we do. 
We could actually decarbonize around 90% of the energy system in the next couple of decades if we really put our mind to it, if we really treated this as an emergency. But even if we do that, if we do that energy transition, we're still going to need a food transition because food on its own can push us beyond 1.5 degrees. Here we see the emissions from the food system in 2050 if we carry on today. And this is compared to a 2050 target if we reduce those emissions by 75%. So what do we need to do to go from the left-hand bar to the right-hand bar? We need a great food transition, like an energy transition. We need a big shift to plant-based diets. We need a rapid reduction in food waste and huge improvements in yields. Now, if you have a look at this, though, the most benefit is plant-rich diets and reducing food waste, things that we can control, things that are under social tipping point dynamics. We recently calculated that if high-income nations switch to a plant-based diet, we would save an area the size of the EU. So not only would we be able to reduce the emissions from the food system, but we'd be able to draw down carbon into those areas, at a continental-sized nature park. What you're seeing here, to show you what this could look like, is a landscape devoid of significant biodiversity, pasture land. There's barely any carbon storage here. Now check this out. This is what would happen if we left it back to nature. Look at the biodiversity, the carbon storage, the cleaner water, the areas in nature to explore and go to the weekends. Nature also reduces our stress, remember. So actually, every single study out there shows that it's good for us, to be better for us in general. The longer that we continue to emit, the worse things are going to get. We're going to have a really bumpy few decades ahead of us. But reducing emissions can actually help us deal with some of these impacts. Take the example of offshore wind farms. These offshore wind farms actually extract energy from storm surges. So they actually reduce the damage that we could actually experience. Also, we could maintain wetlands, and those wetlands, again, would, in, it would absorb that energy and actually continue to draw down carbon. We could also see more plant-based diets leaving more land so we could draw down, so we could have more uh, water uh, absorption uh, from floods. And as more plant-based options become available, we could really reach a tipping point. Research shows that as we have more plant delicious plant-based options, we actually see meat eaters eat more of these options. This is another feedback. And it doesn't need to be a story of abstinence, but it could be one of exploration uh, and experience. When we look at the tipping points in society, this is the empiric empirical data showing how a committed minority of people can actually push the majority to adopt a new convention. As we move up from 10 to 20 to 25%, the system flips. Suddenly, the majority takes on those conventions, those habits. We're at around 5 to 10% vegetarianism in some countries now. It only needs a little push, and we're going to get there. The percentage needed to make a fundamental change in government policy could be even lower. The exact number is quite controversial, but history tells us that revolutions have never needed more than about 3.5% of people actively involved on the streets to make a revolution. Climate litigation is another really important area getting to a tipping point. We've seen an explosion of climate cases recently. And in each of these cases, through this process of litigation, we're able to discover documents from companies that have been lying to us all these years, from their emissions. And what this is doing is it's allowing others to bring even more legal cases against these companies. And as a result, this means that there's a lot of risk for investors. Who would want to invest in high-emitting companies right now with all of this risk around? So the question is, are you guys part of any social tipping points? And what can you do to push these tipping points faster? My advice would be, don't sweat the small stuff. It doesn't matter where your tomatoes come from. If you're not eating steak, that's already a big win. Focus on the big stuff. Focus on insulating houses, switching to renewables. Focus on plant-based diets. Focus on reducing the number of flights that you're taking. But more importantly than any of that, probably, is talk to one another about it. Talk about the changes you're making and why they're so urgent, why they worry you so much. The faster we adopt low-carbon solutions and low-carbon behaviors, the cheaper they get and the easier they are for other people to get involved. So it's a social phenomenon and a social dynamic. Research shows that actually these changes are contagious amongst communities. If I put on solar panels, the neighbors put on solar panels. If I go vegetarian, other people are more likely to go vegetarian. And I'm not saying that systemic change isn't needed. Systemic change is absolutely needed. 
But systems, simultaneously, are made of communities, they're made of individuals, and we can all play a role in overhauling these systems. Think about joining civil action. I know I have it at, at, at uh, Scientist Rebellion. Think about supporting legal cases against high emitters. Find ways to pressure uh, pension funds to divest from fossil fuels. And what can you do in your job? Because climate change is an everything problem. So every single job has an opportunity to be involved in climate change action in some way. And I think finally, it's okay to feel horrified and a little bit overwhelmed about the messages and about climate change and environmental crises. Yet, it's also possible to act and hope in a better future because the hope comes from the acting. A hope that pushes us towards action and a better future. And although that future is going to have more climate impacts and we have a few difficult decades ahead, we can look after one another and look after the most vulnerable in society. We are getting close to so many t social tipping points and we can all give them a shove for a much better future, for future generations, for ourselves and for nature. Thank you.